President Obama insists the media overstates the risk of terrorism and says climate change might be more dangerous. This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. While Jordan bombs ISIS in Syria, Iraq begs for more help for fighting ISIS there, and Boko Haram fighters capture more than 30 people in northern Cameroon. President Obama says the media is exaggerating the threat of terrorism. It comes on a day when another possible threat to global stability, Ukraine, is front and center. We have Fox team coverage tonight. Jennifer Griffin's at the Pentagon with an update on the ever slimmer prospects of avoiding all-out war in the former Soviet Republic. But we begin with the chief White House correspondent, Ed Henry, and some interesting comments from the president about terrorism. Good evening, Ed. Indeed. Good evening, Brett. The president dismissed terror threats as largely being media hype, saying if it bleeds, it leads. But his former military intelligence chief says radical Islam is expanding and the president's strategy is off. At a news conference with German Chancellor Angela Merkel, dominated by threats around the world, President Obama barely mentioned Islamic State terrorists. With regard to ISIL, Germany and the United States remain united in our determination to destroy this barbaric organization. And when it comes to confronting ISIS, the president is downplaying the threat, declaring in a Vox.com interview the media is overhyping terror and climate change could be a bigger long-term problem. It's all about ratings and the, the problems of terrorism and dysfunction and, and chaos uh, along with plane crashes and uh, a few other things that's that's the equivalent when it comes to covering international affairs and climate change is one that is happening at such a broad scale and such a complex system that it's a hard story for uh, I think the media to tell on a day-to-day -day basis. That comes after Friday's speech by his national security advisor, Susan Rice, claiming the U.S. cannot give in to alarmism. And the president said at the national prayer breakfast, Christians also committed terrible deeds hundreds of years ago. That's not the kind of leadership we need to destroy this cancer in the Middle East that's growing rapidly. This comes as the former chief of the Defense Intelligence Agency is intensifying his criticism of the president's ISIS strategy. And I think that there's confusion about what it is that we're facing. It's not just what has been defined as 40,000 fighters in the Islamic State in uh, Iraq and Syria. It's, it's also a large segment within this radical version of Islam that is actually, uh, you know, at, is threatening our way of life. As ISIS put out another propaganda video showing British hostage John Cantley declaring the terror group's gains are breathtaking, in the Vox.com interview, the president compared his role to a mayor who's fighting ordinary crime. It is right and appropriate for us to be vigilant and aggressive in trying to deal with that. The same way that a big city mayor's got to cut the crime rate down uh, if he wants that city to thrive. Now, the president went on to talk about vicious zealots who he says randomly shot up a deli in Paris last month. Of course, he left out that it was a kosher deli that was specifically targeted. Brett? Ed, you know, President Obama was asked about House Speaker John Boehner's invitation to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to address Congress. It, that complicates basically an already rocky relationship between the two countries at odds over the best course going forward with Iran. Here's what the president said today. I don't want to be coy. The Prime Minister and I have a very real difference around Iran, uh, Iran sanctions. From the perspective of U.S. interests, and I believe from the perspective of Israel's interests, although I can't speak for, uh, obviously, uh, the Israeli government, it is far better if we can get a diplomatic solution. So there, there are real differences substantively, but that's separate and apart from uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu coming to Washington. Well, what are you hearing about this address? Well, the real difference he's talking about is about Iran's nuclear program. The president wants to keep talking. Netanyahu, a lot of Republicans, and some Democrats, like Bob Menendez, by the way, want more sanctions against Iran. And a key moment at that news conference today was the president, when I was sitting there, he said, what's the rush in terms of sanctions? Well, Netanyahu had his own news conference today, and he said the rush is he's worried about a bad deal with Iran in which they might be able to keep their nuclear program. Now, the prime minister is vowing he'll go ahead with this speech anyway, while here in the, in the states, we heard from the first senator saying he'll skip it. Socialist Bernie Sanders says he'll boycott. We expect other Democrats might join him, Brett. 
At Henry Live on the North Lawn, Ed, thank you. The U.S. and its European allies are trying to present a united front against Russian leader Vladimir Putin and his involvement in Ukraine. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin on whether giving peace a chance has a chance of working. As Russian-backed rebels accused Ukraine's military of attacking a chemical plant and separatists increased their attacks in eastern Ukraine, the German Chancellor and President Obama met in Washington, trying to avoid the perception of a rift ahead of important diplomatic talks between Germany, France, Ukraine and Russia this Wednesday in Minsk. It is true that if, in fact, diplomacy fails, what I've asked my team to do is to look at all options. And the possibility of lethal defensive weapons is one of those options that's being examined. As to the export of um, arms, I have uh, given you my opinion, but you may rest assured that no matter what we decide, the alliance between the United States and Europe will continue to stand. The first question at the press conference cast doubt on whether Merkel actually opposes arming Ukraine and whether the president ever intends to. I was wondering whether this is a good cop, bad cop act or is this um, a real reflection of difference of views on the situation on the ground? Neither answered the question. Merkel reportedly gave Russian President Vladimir Putin until Wednesday to agree to a ceasefire, eliciting an angry response from the Kremlin spokesman who said, quote, nobody has ever talked to the president in the tone of an ultimatum and could not do so even if they wanted to. Appearing unfazed, Putin flew to Egypt to talk to President Sisi to potentially exploit another rift with the U.S. Fighting by Russian-backed forces has increased in the past two weeks, with heavy shelling today that killed nine Ukrainian troops, injuring 24. Bipartisan support for sending so-called defensive weapons, anti-tank missiles and the like, keeps the pressure on the White House. Republican lawmakers flew to Munich to make their case. How long can Putin sustain a war that he tells his people is not happening? That's why we must provide defensive arms to Ukraine. As the French and German leaders prepared to meet Vladimir Putin Wednesday to try to hammer out a ceasefire, the State Department pushed back on any notion that the U.S. was left out of the Wednesday talks with Putin and any notion that Secretary Kerry reportedly told visiting U.S. lawmakers in Munich that he supports arming Ukraine. In private conversations, the Secretary has stressed the lethal aid would be defensive in nature. Brett. Jennifer Griffin live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. The trial of five suspects in the 9-11 attacks is on hold tonight after a bizarre development in court today. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge has the story from the still very populated Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. Six years into President Obama's promise to close the Guantanamo Bay detention camps, 122 detainees remain. But two miles from the camps at the maximum security court, custom built for the 9-11 trial, the military commission's chief prosecutor told Fox they expect to be working on the case after Mr. Obama leaves office. I think I'll be gainfully employed through November of 2017. In what may be another disappointing setback, further derailing the case at the high security court or a baseless accusation, two 9-11 conspirators alleged today that their translator can't be trusted. One of them telling the court, quote, he was working at the black site with the CIA and we know him from there. The 9-11 defense attorneys claim there is a troubling pattern. All of those things which have dragged out the process have all been government attempts to maintain greater secrecy around the proceedings. After the controversial swap of the Taliban Five where they received a hero's welcome in Qatar, the administration is not ruling out future deals. We don't make predictions uh, and hopefully we're not going to be in a circumstance where we uh, have another uh, individual who was serving our country who we have to bring home. While few analysts expected the administration to swap the Taliban commanders for Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, there are a handful of high-value detainees like Hambali who are still not in the military court system. The 50-year-old is known as the Osama bin Laden of Southeast Asia after his alleged role in a series of bombings after 9-11, including this nightclub. And there is Abu Zubaydah, long described as an al-Qaeda operations chief, who has not been arraigned either. A member of the House and Intelligence Committee believes the White House is so ideologically committed to closing the camps, anything is possible. I'm very concerned that someday America will wake up uh, and see that we have emptied that facility out. It would be enormously risky for, for all of us. 
Even though 54 detainees have been cleared for transfer, the Pentagon's point man for Gitmo policy recently testified to Congress that everyone left in the camps at one time or another had ties to al-Qaeda or the Taliban, Brett. Catherine Harris, live Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Catherine, thank you. Up next, how labor problems out west might affect you and your family. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 32 in Chicago as convicted wife killer Drew Peterson faces new charges of trying to hire a hitman to kill a suburban prosecutor. Peterson is serving a 38-year-old 38-year sentence for killing his third wife. His fourth wife, Stacy, disappeared in 2007 and has never been found. Fox 5 in Las Vegas with a reunion nearly 70 years in the making. Joe Roger, Rogers and Bob West fought side by side through three years and four battles in World War II. This weekend, they were back together for the first time since 1946. Their children arranged that meeting as a birthday present. And this is a live look at Boston from Fox 25. They're getting ready again. Hard to believe the big story there tonight, the third winter storm in two weeks, dumping up to two feet of snow in some areas. Boston has set a record for the most snow in a 30-day period, almost 62 inches. Get ready. That's tonight's live look. Outside the Beltway from Special Report, we'll be right back.